the Counterattack playthrough series, we're continuing with our playthrough of Invasions. It's still turn one. It's still the military phase. All the barbarian nations have activated. Now it's time for kingdoms to activate. And in the game right now, there are two kingdoms. The Guptas in purple, the Persians in gold. From the Avum track, we can see the Persians are age four. The Guptas are age two. Oldest nation goes first, Persia. Okay, here's the Persian nation card. We can see they start the game with a crown here, meaning they're a kingdom. The province they like is listed as Orions, but unlike barbarians, there's no like path for them to follow and like a little flag showing like, hey, this is where you prefer to live, right? They already live in Persia. They have a capital. They're not going anywhere. So um, it's sort of moot, but it does kind of hint like this is where you're going to get some points. They get 20 points if they can convert into an empire. There's no like half points for doing it somewhere else because again, they have already established their homeland. So 20 VP becoming an empire. What other VP do we have? Well, their kill list, Romans, Byzantines, pillagers, which I guess is a raider maybe? Barbarians, one point each. Minus two, that's the first negative I've seen for each looting marker they receive. 20 VP every turn if they attack Roman Byzantium with at least 10 units. There's a clarification in the living rules that's 10 units within a particular step, I believe. So like the unit stack step is pretty much the only way that's gonna happen. Turn three, they wanna move basically to the coast of the Mediterranean. Rome is there, so lots of points for taking stuff from Rome. And when I say Rome here, I mean Eastern Rome, Byzantine, Byzantium. Same thing on turn six. Turn nine, basically like keep pushing towards Constantinople. Get lots of points for taking stuff from Byzantium. Last turn, same thing. And then since they are not barbarians, they don't get a lot of reinforcements. Uh, civilized nations in general just get a list of kings. And so uh, and or leaders. And so we can see here there's lots of named kings and or leaders. So let's talk about what these guys are going to do. Okay, here we are over eastern Persia, just getting a little sense of what's going on around here, right? We have a decent stack of units, but with a really poor leader. It's a satrapis. The star indicates it's like a general. It's not the actual leader of the kingdom. We're going to want to look at what the Gupta's goals are to decide what to do back here. We know the Sogdians are in, inactive, um, minor kingdom, independent minor kingdom. We could try to make them our client, but we got the Kitterites coming down from up there and we know they want Parthia. So we, we got some things to worry about here. These little guys, satrapas, satraps, these are like garrison type units. They can't attack outside of the Persian territories of Mesopotamia, Persis, and Persia Orientalis. Moving west, we can see a massive buildup of forces over here, at least on the Persian side, but the Romans aren't, aren't so bad either. And sometimes I'll say Romans because the Byzantines are the Romans. They're just the eastern half of the Romans, right? Um, so, got a bunch of stuff here. This location is overstacked. That's okay. At the scenario set up, you can overstack, and there are some times where you can overstack as well. Um, these guys, the Lachmids, they are a client of Persia. A client is uh, similar to a vassal, but maybe like less controlled. They're an independent minor kingdom and they're the only things that can become a client. And so uh, a client is essentially a nation that agrees to pay their patron, in this case Persia, money and soldiers. Okay, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, right? Um, there's another client, the Hiberii, and this is why these are both yellow, because they in general, uh, you know, they favor Persia, um, but other countries can make them uh, clients as well. But uh, yeah, so we got, got some client nations on our flanks. Now our nemeses here, the Byzantines, they have a mirror image of clients. The Armenii are their client and the Ghassanids are their client. So little, little Arabian peoples uh, down here and then more powerful um, Caucasian, Caucasus, mountains area, peoples. There's another minor, independent minor kingdom here, the Colchi. They are not um, 
clients of anyone. So they're ripe for being a client. One reason I'm pointing this out is because these clients are going to give troops to their patrons, the Persians and Byzantines respectively, but also it factors in to one of Persia's goals, if it is a goal, and that is to become an empire. A kingdom is eligible to become an empire when it controls three areas. Well, we actually already control three areas. We control Mesopotamia, Persis, and Persis Orientalis. So we could theoretically transition to an empire next turn, but there's like die roll modifiers and things. Um, one of the die roll modifiers in favor is the number of clients you have. So we have two clients. If we can get a third, maybe Armenii or the Colchi um, up there, that'd be good. You'd think we could walk across the desert here to the uh, Gassanids, but you're not. No one's allowed to cross Arabia, um, with the exception of like raiders, if I recall correctly. So they'd have to get around here. So I think two primary goals are: we want to get in a position where we can become an empire. We also want to attack ten. We want to attack Rome, Byzantium, with ten of our units in one step. So we want to try to make that happen. We have more than 10 units here, so it's definitely doable. And then I think we just want to like hold, hold the Guptas. It's possible they could take Persia Orientalis from us and prevent us from becoming an empire. In fact, they probably want to do that. So we want to try to prevent that as much as we can. And I'm talking about a, a lot this stuff a lot, but uh, Persia and Rome being like, the equivalent of superpowers. Uh, they have a decent number of rules around them. Um, another uh, interesting rule is that there's a basically the Roman Persian War is happening, and if Rome can take Tessaphon, and again I'm using Rome generically, if they can take Tessaphon, the capital of Persia, they'll force a very unfriendly peace on the Persians. Uh, they lose a lot of territory, lose a lot of money. So at the end of the Persian activation, they want to make sure Tessaphon is protected. So that's another goal, protect Tessaphon. Another Persian rule, when enemies are invading, they do get to uh, generate like, kind of like a little emergency garrison in the territory being invaded. So they, they have the ability to generate some troops um, when under attack. Oh, and regarding that Roman Persian War, where the if Tessaphon falls, um, it's bad. Well, you see here, there's not a lot of forces here, so you might of the Romans, so you might think, oh yeah, well let's just kill those guys, and uh, Rome won't have anything to do against us. Except, it's called the war is actually called the Julian Persian Campaign. So Julianus, also known as Julian in Anglo speak, who was way over in Gaul he can teleport over to here on the Romans' turn with, I believe, every single Roman unit if they so want it. So it is possible for a massive army to just appear here. So a um, lot of thoughts into the, the Persian situation, but enough chatter. Let's get ready to activate them. Oh, real quick, the Guptas, if we look at their card, which I won't bring up right now, but they essentially want stuff here. I mean, they get points for these two provinces here, which assumes they take this. So Persia Orientalis is up for grabs for the Guptas, so we've got to keep that in mind as well. All right, Persia is like, hey, everybody, I'm about to activate. Do your diplomacy and things like that if you want. I also have some diplomacy to do. And the Byzantines... They know they're uh, one of the targets of Persia. They have a marriage card. So I think they're going to play this. I don't see why they can't play this. So marriage is arranged with the target nation, Persia, and cannot be refused. The playing nation pays the target nation two gold. So they're giving two gold to Persia for this, which, you know, maybe maybe they shouldn't do that. So I just did, adjusted the bank rolls. The target nation gains two VP if it makes no attacks against the playing nation. Well, they're probably going to attack the playing nation, so that means they won't get the 2 VP. 
Uh, in exchange, the playing nation receives one unit of the target nation's choice to place anywhere in its own territory. That's temporary. It gets it for its activation and then has to give it back. So um, this is bad for Persia because they lose one military unit to the Byzantines. And actually, it's to the Romans. It's to the Romans. Um, so I guess they'll, they'll give this crappy infantry unit to the Romans. The Romans put it anywhere. I guess they'll, they'll, they'll station it in, in Rome, way over in Rome. <laughs> and that'll come, again, that'll come back at the end of the Roman activation. Um, so, that's not good. They have these little matrimonium tiles. <laughs> How are you supposed to use these? I don't know. I'm just throwing it on the unit in Persia as a reminder, like, it's or in Rome, I should say, to remind her that Persian unit should come back. So now, uh, no one else has anything, but Persia, guess what? They also have a marriage card. Everyone's getting married before they go to war. I'm not sure how that works out. They're playing it on the Guptas, so that two gold Rome just gave them, they're gonna play on the Guptas. So let me adjust their tracks. Guptas gain two gold. Um, yeah, so, again, in this case, the Guptas might want to get the 2 VP um, if they don't attack Persia. Who knows? Uh, either way, though, the Guptas have to give them something. I think we'll give them this little piece of junk. Uh, you know, no no elite and so on. Um, well, oh, by the way, they, these these units um, will not fight against their own people. So that's that's like a little, little extra oomph there. But hey, hey. We're going to put some Gupta mercenaries in our capital over at Tessaphon here. I'll well, throw a little matrimonium marker there just because I have them and I want to use them. Okay, well, I consider the Persians now activated. Let's go ahead and go with the unit stacks step. Okay, now technically before the unit stack step, but right before, a nation's clients donate a military unit just for the duration of the activation. So the Persians have two clients, the Lachmids, they only have one unit. Now this unit is restricted according to the into the east rules, that's what it comes with. Uh, it can only go to the near east, which would be this area, it can't go off the map here. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and uh, throw it. You can put it anywhere that Persian units may deploy to. So we'll throw it there, just keep it kind of near the front line. The other client is the Hiberni? Is that what that is? Hiberi? Hiberi? Something like that. Um, they have three units, have to randomly select one, so we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a four. I mean, they're all the same, but it's not really. Okay, and I think we'll just have him deploy down with the Lachmids. A little tiny army there. So one of our goals is to get 10 Persian units engaged with Roman units, right? So I think we're going to grab these guys. This is an overstacked unit. Oh, there's a little upside down satrap, which is not allowed to leave Persia, like I said before. I want to pin this stack down. This is the most powerful stack in the area right now. So um, we can stack up to four units plus two for support the second tier. It's got a plus two there. Um, we have seven units, so I'm gonna have to leave one behind. I guess we'll leave this guy behind. Okay, and we're just gonna go, bam, we're not gonna like maneuver or anything. So we'll go ahead and move some other units too, but right now the, the Romans have several options. They need to um, declare whether they're gonna intercept, you know, with other units, or whether they're gonna retreat. So let me think about that. I think as the Romans, Byzantines, I'm inclined to give ground to avoid both losing this stack, because, you know, when the Romans go, they'll have a counterattack coming, um, but also to try to avoid the Persians attacking with 10 unique units against Roman units. So uh, we're going to try to flee with this Caesar. So the bonus will be plus one for the combat value of the Caesar plus three for starting in a 
province with a fortified city. So there's, I trust, trust me, there's a fortified city under there. And I'm gonna avoid the minus one for, tra for crossing a river on your first move um, by going here as my target, my initial target. So uh, we need um, nine or more, and that was a uh, plus four. So 11, yep. So this guy flees. When you flee, you can go up to three paces. I'm only going one pace because um, there's a fortified city here too, so I feel my chances are good if I want to flee again. But what that did was it bogged these guys down and they have to stop and we'll, we'll process the, uh, the combat there. Technically, uh, the Lemus are gone right now, but I'll, I'll just do it as part of combat. Okay, so now that this Caesar's out of the way a little bit, I think we'll move some of these units. So first, this plain old infantry is going to join with the Hiberi, the Lachmids, oh, and a Satrap, so I guess that guy's not going to do much. <laughs> um, let's see, can they get anyone else up there? There's Gupta, one, two, three. He can't go far enough. So um, I guess these three guys will head out into the Palmyrene Desert here. Okay, um, that is neutral territory, so no one can intercept. Okay, but these, these camel cavalry over here see it coming. Move right into here. It's two moves. Um, one guy came from here though, so that's one, two, three. Um, the cavalry need to decide if they're going to run. The Legion down here in Sinai needs to decide if it's going to intercept. Caesar could intercept. Um, even this Legion can intercept up here, but you can only have one Legion intercept that doesn't have a leader. Okay, so I have to decide who's going to intercept, if anyone. Caesar can intercept, but he's trying to block this guy here, I guess. This guy's three paces away, he can intercept. Uh, there's a negative for being three paces away, though. This guy can intercept. Um, you have to declare all your interceptions, though, and you can only do one leaderless stack. So I'm inclined to have this guy try to intercept here. Uh, you get plus two for being an empire, and that looks to be the only bonus available to this. And we're, we're looking for a die roll greater than six. So intercepting is easier than fleeing, at least if you're looking at raw. Um, die roll modifiers, of course, uh, he was just sleeping down there in Sinai. Pretty sure... I can wait to see if the interception happens and then decide if I want to flee with the camels. I'm going to double check that. Yeah, my little cheat sheet says you can do them in any order. Uh, incidentally, it also says note the interception table on the map has the wrong modifiers. So use something you download. Okay, so uh, there's no modifiers for this guy fleeing other than uh, plus three fortified city. I'm inclined to have him flee. Just to, just to avoid a Roman unit engaging with Persians. So um, plus three, we need uh, nine or more, 10. So he does flee, and I should have said at least the direction he's going. If there, I guess if there was a river nearby is the only time I would care. But you know, you probably should announce it beforehand, um, at least the very first move you're gonna do. So I think I'm inclined to just have him um, Roll back to um, Phoenicia here. I'm going to Phoenicia because it's got a fortified city. Now these guys, uh, two of them have two moves left. So maybe it's not good that I am pulling that guy back um, because two of them can keep going because they started here, one, two, three. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna cheat just, you know, I'm learning the rules. So like if I thought about that, you know, and wasn't all nervous from filming, um, I would have left him there. Um, because I want, I don't want these guys getting too far in and looting all kinds of cities that don't even have walls on them and stuff. So that's going to be 3.3 unique units of the Persians, even though these are not technically Persian units, they count as Persian units right now. Um, so they're going to get that 20 point bonus for sure for attacking with 10 unique units. Okay, next, I'm not sure if this is a good move. It's more for illustrative purposes, I think, but this stack of five um, cavalry units, three are horse archers, two are sort of heavy-ish cavalry. Um, we're in the mountains, so we can only like move three into mountain provinces. I don't think this is worth attacking here. What do we got? We got very heavy uh, Roman infantry. You know, it's like double veterans. Here's a regular legion, archers, 
Um, oh yeah, so this Caesar has like the cream of the crop for the Byzantines. This is a double veteran um, cavalry there as well. Hmm, a fortified city. So I think instead, I'm going to go around. And I think we'll start with these non-horse archers, maybe. They're going to move into Armenia. The Armenians, they are a Roman client. They can't intercept. And since they're a client, they're considered neutral and not controlled by Rome. So that means Rome can't intercept into there. But what they can do is decide if they want to flee. Now let me tell you why I'm doing this here. For starters, worst case, I kill an Armenian unit and take a province of Armenia if, if I choose to leave these guys here. Um, turn three, that province is worth like five points, I think, if I grab it. But there's another thing going on. If these guys don't flee, I could declare a passage in force. What that is, is if I uh, move in with twice as many units as our defenders, they can be basically blanketing the defenders and then allow other units to pass through rather than having to stop. The exceptions are Lemus. You always stop on Lemus. Fortified cities, you cannot do a passage in force. And then um, I think straits maybe, um, but that doesn't apply. So first, you know, the, my opponent doesn't know I'm passaging in force. They just know I'm trying to attack Armenia. So they have to decide, do they want the Armenians to try to flee? Remembering the, like, the combat tables, it's unlikely the Armenians are going to do much here, right? They're, even if they get a hit, the enemy will likely uh, recover. So I'm inclined to try to make them flee. Uh, in this case, there are no bonuses that I can see they're going to flee. They can only flee one place to their, their capital, which is where the double stack of units is here. So uh, yes, yes, it looks like it's just a straight flee roll. I should have showed you. Well, here I'll show you. It's a two. Um, so regardless of any modifiers, they fail. So these guys are have to stop. But now for the pathogen force, which I am going to do, I'm going to move three horse archers over to here, to Mylatine, which is an undefended fortified city. Now this might be dumb, right? Like, if Caesar intercepts, like, they're probably dead, but yeah, let's, let's just see how this goes. Yeah, that is intolerable. These guys are going to try to intercept. They need a six or more, plus one for the leader's combat bonus, plus two because they're an empire. Um, that's it. Rivers don't matter. So nine plus three, they intercept. And I think they'll probably take the whole mess. Because there's really no um, Persians left other than this one guy down in Chaldea. One, two, three. He can't get up to the, lim the Lemus there. So, yeah, so this guy's stacking is plus two, but there's only four units with him. Um, oh, well, he needs that because they're going into mountains. So we'll intercept there. Um, I should have announced if I'm going to intercept with anyone else, and I think I would have. I would have intercepted with this guy too. Um, in fact, we'll do the one farther away over here, because he's not he's not three away, um, which would give a negative. So here, let's just see what the roll is. We've got a five. That's plus two for empire. Um, no minuses. So that's six or more. So this guy gets in there as well. And then this guy can't because I already intercepted with a leaderless unit. Okay. So it pretty much looks like everyone is spent over here in the east. I'm inclined to do, um, to move this guy maybe. I think this guy uh, will be given back. I'm trying to remember. I think I already mentioned this rule, but he's going to be given back at some point. But um, I think I'm going to just move him up to like here. Just like be a little blocking location. Okay, let's go over to the east. Guptas have me worried. I'm just gonna like shuffle around a little. So I get this stack of, you know, a bunch of guys here. And I have this little horse archer up here. I think I'm gonna bring him down. They're not so hot in the mountains. Bring this guy up there. And then we'll just keep this force like sort of a mobile force. Not very good at intercepting though. Um, not an empire, so it's going to just be a plus one for most interceptions. But that's all we're going to do. <laughs> it's going to be bad. Um, but yeah, I think we've just finished the unit stacks step, and it's time to resolve all the combat situations.
It's the attacker's choice which battles get resolved in what order. So we'll go ahead and do this uh, one down here first. Um, I'm a little nervous about this one because if that goes first, these guys might not have a retreat path. Can they even retreat? <laughs> I don't know. Can you retreat through a passage in force? Uh, it's going to get a little iffy there, but uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll start with this one down here. Okay, we have the uh, Battle of Damascus. We're not in mountains, so there's no uh, archery ambush, but there are two archers on the uh, Persian side. That's the regular old archers. We're in clear terrain, so uh, that's going to be plus two. The enemy does not have the heavy advantage, so we're just doing uh, 2d6 plus two. Let's see, that's a seven plus two is nine. That's one hit. It's going to be really quick, isn't it? Bam. One point to the Persians. This is a very small battle because there's only one unit on one of the uh, sides and therefore no one can recover at the end of the battle. Now the Persians find themselves in a province with a fortified city and when you find yourself there you have to keep moving on, which we can't because our moves are over, retreat one to three spaces or besiege it. So we're going to besiege it. We're going to roll a 10-sided die, looking for a 7 or more. Uh, we get plus 1 because we're a civilized besieger. Minus 2 for the wall value, so we're looking at minus 1 right now. So I could order an assault, and that's where the besieger takes 2 hits. And, you know, <laughs> uh, these guys, like, they're willing to sacrifice themselves to breach those walls. I believe clients will regenerate a unit each turn, so, you know. I will be a little weaker doing this when the Romans counterattack, but I'm inclined to try to get this city. Um, yeah, so that, would I say we're minus one, so now we're back at plus one. It's effectively only a six plus, which is a six, seven, eight, nine, ten, no, 50% chance. Yeah, so I have a small mind for math, so we got a ten. We've breached the walls, the city capitulates. Well, I got too fired up. I flipped it back over because the walls are still intact. They're intact. But uh, there is an option to get rid of those. So uh, the question is to loot. Do we want to loot? And I have a really hard time understanding why I would never not want to loot. I guess I could draw an event um, that's negative to me. But I think I'm always going to loot, right? Um, so we're going to loot, and but we automatically get two gold. I'll throw just like a little two there, just just because we're looting. But then we draw a number of pillage markers, we saw this before, per city level of the city, well there's only one. So what we find in this city? Three gold, so we got another three, so we got five gold out of this. Um, and then we draw another pillage marker, we'll just put it with the city to indicate like the citizens have been, you know, stripped of all their gold. Now we decide, do we want to tear down the walls? If we keep the city, we keep the walls. So I'm kind of inclined to keep the walls. I vaguely remember some rules about controlling provinces by Persia in Oriens. So let me go see what's up there. Ah, yeah, there's, there's some rules, but basically uh, it's more difficult for Persia to control Cappadocia, Oriens, Asia. So, um, but that's okay. That's okay. We're going we're gonna to keep the walls. Those are now our walls. Let's go back to the map. Okay, so here we are. Um, the Romans lost two points for me pillaging their city, for looting the city. Um, but they got two points for those two units I sacrificed taking the city. And even though they were a Lachmid and a Hiberi, Hiberni, Hiberi, um, when they are in my service, they count as Persian units. And the Byzantines get a point for each Persian unit eliminated. So that was a net point. Um, for the Romans, zero, but I get plus one because I killed their camel cavalry. I also got the city, got the province, so I think that was good. That was good. So um, I was thinking this like a big battle here, but I forgot the Romans retreated, so it's just this is destroyed, one point. There's a 50% chance of them damaging a Persian unit, so we're looking for an even number to do damage. Got an even number. So uh, Persians. Ooh, they're all like kind of okay guys. So um, I guess we'll 
We'll take a veteran unit so it's not destroyed. Um, and we now need to besiege Amida. Is that the name of the city? Dara, in the province of Amida. Oh, but what's this? What's this? The Byzantines? They're bribing the besiegers or the engineers that they hired or whatever. Cancel the siege, cannot be refused. We have to pay a gold to the besieging nation. So Sapor's gonna have to retreat. Let's see, how many units he has? He has six, yeah. So I think he's gonna retreat. He's gonna drop off that wounded one on during the retreat. And go one more pace. Because he wants to pick up these guptas when it's time for his leader campaign. Okay, so the Romans held Dara. Okay, let's do this one. Because that way if I win, I don't have to try to figure out what I do when I retreat across a passage in force. And that'll make things easier. Okay, here we are. This is a, actually a very close battle. There's no heavy advantage, no um, elite bonus. Uh, there is a cavalry advantage. That's what this plus one is for. Uh, but that's basically it. There's not much to this battle. We're going to make the Persians green. Um, yeah, so let's go. What do we got here? We got um, eight plus one is nine and five for the um, Armenians. So Armenians rolling five to zero hits because they only have one unit. Two units for the Persians rolling a nine. Was that what that was? Yeah, one and a half. Um, we're in the mountains, so we don't round up, but that doesn't matter because this guy destroyed. Small battle, no recovery. Whew. Okay, I lucked out. Now the Persians, they get points for killing Romans, Byzantines, pillagers, raiders, I guess, barbarians. This guy, he's just a neutral dude. He's like pays his taxes to Rome and stuff, but I don't think he's Roman. So um, I don't think they get a point for that. Okay, if I count the number of Persian units that have interacted with Roman units, it's nine. These two didn't count. Again, Armenians are not Romans. They're not serving in the Roman army, therefore they're not Romans. This, this hits 10. So we're gonna call it right now. The Persians got the 20 victory point bonus for attacking with 10 units against Romans in any phase, which this is, this is the, um, military phase. Um, I guess technically it's the unit stacks step in combat. That that's that counts as one group. The other group would be the leader campaigns section. So anyway, they got 20 points. Oh, one thing I missed, Into the East expansion says that when the Romans and Persians are at war, the Armenians get an heavy veteran cavalry into the capital. I should have done that um, as soon as the Persians went to war. Okay, here we go. Both sides have archers. The Romans have one archer, regular archer. The Persians have three cavalry archers. The terrain is step, so they're worth one and a half die roll modifiers times three. That's four and a half, round up to five, but that's a three. It's a three because the Romans have the heavy advantage. Persians have no heavies, so the Romans have, need at least two heavies against no heavies to have the uh, heavy advantage. Uh, so. Let's uh, go ahead and roll plus one and plus three. Got my uh, Persian colored dice today. So um, let's see. Looks like we have an eight and a seven. Eight is one hit in clear desert or step. Seven is a miss. So already I see disaster looming here. Hey, uh, one thing I just realized is that I'm fighting this as a uh, during the combat portion of the unit stack step, but these guys were intercepted, so I should have done this as part of the interception, because if they win, which they won't, <laughs> uh, they can keep on moving if they. But uh, so little little asterisk there on my gameplay, right? But uh, we'll go ahead and uh, continue with this. Okay, first round of melee. Let's see what we have here. We have a uh, heavy advantage. So these guys get a minus one, I believe, over here. Yeah, minus one. So they're minus one here. 
Um, these guys also get plus two to the defenders, um, even though they intercepted to the defenders. So they get plus two because they're an empire with a fortified city in the defensive location. They also get plus one for having two uh, elite. And since they're Rome or Byzantium, they get another plus one for having four elite, which they do. So that's a total of plus four. Um, neither side has cavalry advantage. Uh, the Persians lost it when the sky died. Okay, Persians got 11 plus 1 is 12. Romans got 8 plus 4 is 12. So maximum casualties. Unfortunately, the Persians only have two units on the board, which means there's only two kills they can do. The Romans have five combat units on the board, which is three and a half kills, more than enough to wipe them out. Um, honestly, the Romans could roll really poorly and still do that. Um, let's see. Yeah, but... But it looks like the ca the uh, Persians have a good chance of, if they had to re-roll, of um, doing one less combat fatality. So Romans, um, this guy has one re-roll, so he's going to make the Persians re-roll. And uh, that's a six, plus one is seven. Seven is only one kill. Okay, so that's better. So these guys are wiped out, but they do one hit to the Romans which will be no big deal, right? Because they just flip this guy over. Okay, and then during recovery, he flips back. Now, this is not a small battle, so they get to flip two units. So it's kind of tough to wipe out a force, unless it's a small force. Three losses for the Persians, even though two recovered. That's three points to the Romans. The Persians get one point for just killing the the archer that later recovered. Okay, so I have a little bit of doubt about if I played that correctly. My take is, even though these guys were wiped out, I don't see anything in the rules that say, oh, if you're wiped out, you don't recover. So they recovered and now have to retreat. So they will, um, I think they'll retreat to here and that's max stacking. So we'll keep have one, keep on going. You're always able to violate stacking in friendly and neutral territory but you have to be able to you know get it right before uh before the end of the turn basically you know um so anyway um i think that's what i want so does this guy want to keep moving back um i think he does i think he's gonna move back to to here actually that was one two three my reason for doing that is to get him near Sapur, just in case, you know, Sapur wants to use him during his leader campaign. Okay, so technically that was an intercept battle, but in the end it's the same effect. Okay, and uh, I think that means the unit stack step is over, and it's time for leader campaigns. Now, the Persians actually have two leaders. They got Sapur the second, and they have this generic Satrapis. He has one campaign. I see no real reason to do anything with him right now. You know, maybe maybe later. Maybe in another turn. But uh, Sapur gets two campaigns. I think he's going to use at least one of those. Yeah, we are. We are. We're going to take this entire stack, including the Gupta unit that I picked up. We're going to go one, two into Amida. And we have to stop because we want to siege it. That is the Roman city that uh, we failed to take last time. I guess we were, uh, yeah, we were unable to take it. So, uh, yeah, we're going to siege this guy. The city wall bonus is minus two. It's a civilized besieger, so that's plus one for a total of minus one. So I have to decide, do I want to sacrifice two units to take the city? Yes. I think we'll sacrifice all these little purple Gupta guys, you know? There. They look fired up about this. And what else do we have? I guess we'll sacrifice a heavy infantry as well. Honestly, I, it's a hit that I could... Maybe it's better to take a, a hit to a um, elite unit and sacrifice the Gupta. That's what we'll do. So Gupta gone. 
Okay, so that gives us a plus two for a total of plus one. Let's go. We're looking to roll. If I remember right, yeah, seven or more. And I don't know why I'm rolling the white dice. It's the yellow dice I'm rolling. So five plus one is six. Ugh, ugh, ah. But Sapur has two rerolls. So uh, let's do that again. We got this. <sighs> Done. All right, took the city. This is, for all intents and purposes, a Persian unit, but it's now dead and going to the Gupta force pool. I've logged a minus one victory point for the Romans because they get minus two for having a looted city. Hey, I'm looting it. And uh, plus one for killing that Persian Gupta unit. So we got here three point, uh, three gold, plus the two gold you get no matter what. So that's a total of five gold. Man, the Persians are making out on these, this looting. But there's an event here, Usurpator, Usurper. Not sure what to do there. Let's figure this out. Well, what that says is on a roll of 10, because we're a civilized nation and we're not in decline, um, something bad will happen. If we're in decline, it'd be worse. Not a 10, so someday we'll learn what that means. But not right now. So we'll go ahead and draw a pillage marker to indicate all the gold in the area has been ripped out. And um, this guy's campaign has ended but he has one more campaign because that number right there is a two. Now, if we didn't have a first turn rule of the uh, Julian Persian War, whatever it's called, something like that, um, where the Persian capital being captured by the Romans enforces a really harsh peace, I think I would be more aggressive with my next campaign and just move in, right? Move into Orions and all that. Um, but, or I guess I'm already in Orions, but you know what I mean? But uh, really, I think I need to reposition this guy to defend the capital, Tessaphon, down here. So, I do want to leave some units behind, though, to protect that um, location. So, I'm inclined to, I don't know, maybe leave, do I really want to leave heavies behind? Hmm, maybe we'll just, we'll just leave a little archer behind, get a little hot shot at anyone trying to capture that spot. Um, also, in order to keep it, I need a unit there. Um, it's a special rule about Persians and Orions, they gotta keep units there. So I got four units in my leader. I think he's gonna move back one, pick up two units, one of which is a damaged veteran unit. Um, so we're max stack right now, so that's one, two, three, uh, four, two, Tessaphon. Do I really want to go back that far? I think I do because I'm afraid the Romans will figure out a different path through, and if I block here and can't intercept, it's going to be bad. So I'm just going to stack on Tessaphon. Also, check it out. This guy theoretically can intercept into Tessaphon. Yeah. So um, I think the Romans will have a tough time taking Tessaphon, though he would be overstacked. So, you know, maybe not so, so easily. All right, well, that was the Persian activation. That was fun. Thanks for watching. Next time, we're gonna do some Guptas. Maybe we'll even get the Romans in.